Hey everyone, Leo Kelly G. And no, you didn't just misread that title. I have just learned every single song off of the Room for Squares album by John Mayer. And not just the acoustic guitar parts. I have learned, transcribed, and recorded every single guitar part on the entire Room for Squares album. Why the hell would I do that, might you ask? Are you sick? No. Are you dying? No. Did you think that by learning all of his songs that he'd notice you and acknowledge you as his successor like JD and Dr. Cox in Scrubs? Mm. Shut up. The reason that I tabbed out the entirety of Room for Squares is because I wanted to find out at a base level what makes John Mayer, John Mayer. What sorts of chords does he use? How does he play those chords? How does he strum? How does he pick? How does he look at the neck of the guitar when he comes to write music and what can be learned from playing guitar in that style? In this video, I wanna talk about the process I went through to learn and transcribe these songs, what these songs taught me about John Mayer as a guitarist, what these songs taught me about John Mayer as a songwriter, and most importantly, why I believe that learning these songs can help you to become a better guitarist as well. Let's get into it. Before before we start, however, please be sure to like and subscribe to the channel and push the notification bell so you stay up to date with all the new content that's coming out. Also, please be sure to check out my Patreon as well. Because of the nature of the videos that I'm making, most of them are being demonetized because I'm using copyrighted content in order to make guitar tutorials. And so if you can support this channel on Patreon, I can keep making content for you guys and keep making videos that you guys enjoy. It's only three pounds a month and you get access to all the guitar tabs and all the videos early, as well as guitar pro tabs, which allow you to play the music that I've tabbed out in real time, as well as edit the speed so you can speed up all or slow down the tab to your liking and also isolate different instruments as well. As I said before, most of the videos that I'm making on this channel at the moment are being demonetized because I'm using copyrighted content to make guitar tutorials for you guys. And so if you could come and support me on Patreon, that'd be much appreciated. And so without further ado, let's get into the video. Room for Squares is John Mayer's debut studio album and was released on the 18th of September 2001. The album can actually be seen as an extension of his debut EP, Inside Once Out, which he released back in 1999 and features four tracks from the original EP, No Such Thing, Neon, My Stupid Mouth and Back To You. The first three of which, along with Love Song For No One, were co-written with Clay Cook. John Mayer's course mate who he dropped out of Berkeley with to pursue a career as an artist. Although Mayer and Cook parted ways due to musical differences, Cook is still featured on Room for Squares as a backing vocalist on Why Georgia, Neon and Back to You. The album was produced by John Alasia, who would work with artists such as Dave Matthews Band and Ben Folds before working with John Mayer. Alasia also plays auxiliary guitar on Neon and Back to You. Other contributions to the album came from David Labriere on bass, Nearzy on drums, Brandon Bush on keys, Doug Derryberry on BVs and Chris Fisher on congas, as well as Carol Rabinowitz, John Catchings, Christian Wilkinson, David Angel, David Davison and Jerry Marotta on strings. Mayer is quoted as saying that Room for Squares was his shot to see if he had it or not. Although the album was relatively unknown at the time of its release in 2001, it began to gain momentum due to John's touring and reached number one on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart by 2002, peaking at number eight on the Billboard Top 200 and earning John a Grammy for Best Male Pop Vocalist in 2003. So how did I learn these songs? I learned these songs mostly by ear listening to tracks and I really recommend anyone attempting to learn an instrument or any kind of song to at least try this before trying to look for a tutorial. It's so important for your ear not only to be able to identify certain notes but also to understand where those notes actually fit on the guitar and how they sound in different places as well. If I play a D major chord here for example versus playing it here technically they're the same notes in the same order but you can hear even just by listening it's a completely different sound in terms of the way the notes are actually coming out. Also, if I'm learning a song by an artist and I can hear they're playing a D major chord here, for example, from there I can assume there are a few other chords in a similar kind of place that they're also gonna use, as opposed to if they play one down here. The fact that the artist might play a D major chord as an open chord up here as well tells me something about them in terms of the way they approach songs. Are they an artist whose default chords are open chords? Are their hands suited to playing certain chords and not other chords? All of these questions that you answer by using your ears instead of going straight to a tutorial will make you not just a better player, but also a better musician as well. The other thing that I did while learning these songs was to watch as many live videos of John Mayer playing them as I possibly could. This was helpful not so much to hear what he was playing, but how he was playing it. A good example of this would be an E major shape A chord. I can play the A major chord like this with a bar and play the E, D, G, and B strings. And there'd be no difference sonically between doing that and playing it Hendrix style with my thumb over the E string instead. If I watch a live video and see them playing an A chord like this, for example, instead of like this, it gives me an insight into how they conceptualize the guitar and how they look at the guitar neck as a guitar player. If I play an A chord like this, I've got a lot more freedom with my fingers to add other embellishments to the chord, which I can't do if I'm holding an A chord down with a bar. Another thing that I think is massively underlooked that you can get from watching live footage is what a guitar player does with their strumming hand. How do they hold their pick? 
which fingers are they using to pluck certain notes? What do they do with their fingers while they're strumming? So much of the way a guitar player sounds is due to the ergonomics of their hands, which chords are easily available to them or how they make a note sing in a certain way. All of these little details and idiosyncrasies you can find out by watching someone play a song live. Even if you're not struggling to hear what's going on with the song and you can hear every note perfectly, try and find a video of the song being played live by the artist who wrote it as it can be really useful in understanding where they've actually come from when they wrote the piece of music you're trying to learn. So what did I learn about John Mayer as a guitarist by transcribing all the songs off Room for Squares? I've been a fan of John Mayer since I was 14, so already had quite a good knowledge of his songs and the way that he played guitar. I actually used to know his music so well that I used to have my friends play a game which was Identify the John Mayer Song, where they'd pick a John Mayer song at random, and within the first two seconds I could tell you exactly what song it was. Even from the live albums from Any Given Thursday or Live in LA, I could tell you the song it was by the type of applause that preceded the music actually starting. Are you sick? N but, fanboying aside, I'd never learned all of the songs of Room for Squares, especially some of the more obscure ones, and so it was a really fun exercise to try and transcribe the songs that I'd not learned before. So here are the four main things that I learned about John Mayer as a guitarist from transcribing Room for Squares. Number one, anatomically, John Mayer was born to play guitar. I don't know exactly how big John Mayer's hands are, but some of the chords that he's able to play are quite frankly ridiculous. And I think this is a big element and a big aspect of the way that he sounds as a guitar player, because the chords that he's able to play are just unavailable and not only unavailable in terms of anatomically being able to reach them but also because other guitar players don't think of those chords because they can't reach them as well he has a very unique sound as a guitar player as a result of the size of his hands a good example of this is the c riff in y georgia when he gets to this chord now i play it like this because that's the way that my fingers can reach it whereas john mayer reaches his thumb all the way around to play the a string with his thumb bars there and then is somehow able to use his ring finger to reach all the way down to the fifth fret and then back again which is just not something that anatomically i am able to do similar thing with the last chord in neon when you come to play this chord here i can't reach my thumb to play the 10th fret of the e string and my first finger to play the seventh fret of the g string at the same time while barring that entire chord and so I have to play like this instead. But as a result of that, that chord in that particular way would never occur to me to play. And so again, you can sort of see because of the way that his hands work and the things that he's able to do with his hands, it means that certain chords just occur to him that wouldn't necessarily occur if his hands were any other size than they were. Number two, he's largely self-taught. Although John Mayer did have guitar lessons growing up, the way that he uses his thumb and finger on his right hand is really, really unorthodox. Obviously it works for him, but the fact that he primarily only uses his thumb and his index finger to get around the guitar when he's not using a pick, so suggests that most of his technique has been honed by actually going out and playing and using whatever means he has necessary to get the sound that he's trying to get out of the instrument. Once again, this is why it's so important to watch live footage of people playing, because you might assume, as a lot of people do with Neon for example, that the song is being played in a certain way with a certain type of fingering when it isn't, and that can then lead you to tie yourself in knots over how the song is played, or even worse, do a tutorial on the song, which is actually wrong. Looking at you, everyone who tries to teach this song, every now and again you'll get guitar players either anatomically or theoretically or for whatever reason that that are able to just look and conceptualize the guitar in a fundamentally different way to most other people and it leads to some really really interesting and unique sounds that the instrument can make. Number three, he is a criminally underrated rhythm guitar player. Of course nowadays John Mayer is known as one of the best electric guitar players in the world. I think Rick Beato in one of his videos actually said that he's the last guitar hero alive and to an extent I think that's true. But have you ever tried singing and playing his songs at the same time? If you do, you'll find out, as I did, just how rhythmically complex and diverse the way he's accompanying himself actually is. I feel like it's his acoustic playing and his sense of rhythm and timing that really set him apart as a singer-songwriter from other people who play guitar and sing in a similar sort of vein. And you can really hear that on Room for Squares. Aspiring guitarists and singer-songwriters could do a lot worse than learning a few John Mayer songs to up their coordination and accompaniment skills. Number four, he is a massive Hendrix and SRV fan. It's no secret that John Mayer is a huge fan of Jimi Hendrix and Stevie Ray Vaughan, but when you actually break down his playing, you can see and hear it even more clearly. So wrapping your thumb around the back of the neck on the E string and the A string to play certain chords, was popularized by Jimi Hendrix and carried on by Steve Ray Vaughan and a lot of guitar players do it now as well but I think this is a fundamental aspect to John Mayer's playing as a result of the Jimi Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan influence that really can't be underlooked. If you play a G major as a regular bar chord like this you can get the same sort of sound if you wrap your thumb around the bass string and then play the other five strings with your fingers but as I mentioned earlier playing with the bar chord doesn't give you the same freedom to embellish the chord as you have if you wrap your thumb around the bass string these fingers are then freer to add different inversions or different additions onto the chord, 
that you can't reach if you've got a bar sort of blocking you off on the third fret if you're playing a G chord, for example. Another thing that I think is really important about playing in this style is that it kind of chops the guitar in half in terms of the bass note that's being played and then the harmony that's being played on top. For example, if I want to play a G6 with a flat nine, I can play my G note on the bass, I can find my six, which is here as an E string, and then if I can find my flat nine up here, I can sort of then work out a way of then playing a G6 flat nine like that, which if I was playing with a bar, I'm stuck with this finger over these six strings, and then I've only got three fingers to find myself a six and a flat nine, as well as not having any of the notes that are being barred on the third fret, changing the harmony again. And so by wrapping my thumb around this way, it's just a really easy way to conceptualize how the chords are put together, because you have your G, and then you have your harmony over the top. Same sort of thing if I wanted to play like a G over A, for example, I've got my G over A, so here's my G, here's my A. And so I think just conceptually, this really underpins the way he approaches guitar and also a lot of the embellishments and extra things that he puts on aren't necessarily chords that he's consciously thinking about and trying to play really complicated voicings. It's just because he's got another free finger, you might as well add something on top of the chord to give it a bit more sort of flavor and a bit more spice, so to speak. Another thing that's really interesting is that obviously John Mayer didn't play guitar on the entire album. John Alasia played some guitar parts as well. And because of the Hendrix influence and the SRV influence, you can really hear on the extra guitar parts when John Mayer's playing them and when John Alasia's playing them too. So John Mayer came into my life at a really formative age when I was just starting to learn guitar and also when I was just starting to try and write my own songs. And so a lot of John Mayer's influence is kind of subconsciously in my songwriting process already. And so learning the rest of the songs off of Room for Squares was a really interesting way to sort of reverse engineer the process that I go through when I write songs and see which parts are John Mayer influences and which parts aren't. And so the whole thing was a really, really fun experience doing that. And so these are the top three things that I learned about John Mayer as a songwriter by transcribing Room for Squares. Number one, chords from parallel keys to to allow bluesy playing. So this is something that I think John Mayer does really, really well. So just to explain what a parallel key is, if we take the chords from C major, the one chord being C major, D minor is the two chord, E minor is the three chord, F major is the four chord, John Mayer influence there again, using my thumb, uh, G major is the five chord, A minor is the six chord, B minor seven flat five, or B diminished as the seven chord, and then back to the one chord again. That will allow your melody to sit quite comfortably within the C major scale. However, if you borrow chords from the parallel key, so C minor, you then have certain notes in certain chords that will then sound a little bit more interesting. If we take the chords from C natural minor, so C minor being the one chord, D diminished or D minor seven flat five as the two, E flat major is the three, F minor is the four, G minor is the five, G sharp minor as the, G sharp major, sorry, as the six, B flat major is the seven, and then on our back as the one chord. We can borrow some of the chords there and tear some of the major chords, for example, F major, which is in C major into F minor. And then we have a slightly more interesting melody or different notes that we can then choose from melodically. So for example, if I was to go as being in C major, this is F, so all of those notes are all in C major. Whereas if I go from C major to F minor, I can go and already you can sort of hear that that sounds a little bit more bluesy if I'm bending a note, so. It gives the melody a bit more character and it gives you the sort of freedom to play those notes without them sounding like they're not in the key. And this is what John Mayer does really, really well in the solo for City Love, where he goes from being in D major, using G major seven, and then D major seven, obviously the song's in drop D usually, and then moves over to B flat major seven, and then F major seven, and it gives the whole thing a really, really interesting melodic difference and melodic change in the solo, and also in terms of the actual vocal melody that he uses as well. And so this is something that John Mayer does really, really well, and it's littered through this entire album. Number two, the Berkeley slash Clay Cook influence in John Mayer's earlier life is really present on this album, and I think it diminishes in later albums. Room for Squares was released two years after John Mayer dropped out of Berkeley, and obviously he dropped out of Berkeley with Clay Cook, and they actually toured around Atlanta as the Lo-Fi Masters before John Mayer wanted to go his own direction direction to pursue a more pop career. And so I'm not sure whether it was studying at Berkeley and sort of having slightly more advanced harmony being taught or whether it was just a result of being in a band with Clay Cook, but I think harmonically this body of work as Room for Squares, including Inside One's Out, is definitely John Mayer's richest in terms of actual harmony being used. So if we take St. Patrick's Day, for example, we start off on an E major nine chord to a G sharp seven over C, C minor 11, like A sharp or a B flat minor seven flat five, to A major seven, A minor nine, like E sus two over G sharp, and then 
like G sharp, major nine. There's so many chords in there which are so harmonically rich that you just don't see on like continuum or battle studies. Nothing has that level of kind of harmonic richness in the same way that exists in Room for Squares. Even in lesser known songs like Not Myself, it leads back into the last chorus going from the G to this like uh, G major seven over B up to like an F uh, major nine and then to this. So the same way as it did before, sort of in the previous um, chords. I mean, even there you have like an F major nine over a B flat, you know, really, really nice chord. Then it leads into this, like a G sharp six arpeggio to bring you back into G major again, which is a really, really interesting harmonic choice again, which you don't see in later work. Whether he was just aiming for music that was more commercial in later albums, or whether the harmonic landscape of music changed to the point where sort of more popular songs were using less rich harmony, I think this is definitely his richest body of work harmonically. And it's really interesting as a songwriter to discover all of these different things you can do in certain keys that before I listened to John Mayer, these things never occurred to me to do. I was sort of playing four chord songs, maybe borrowing a couple of chords from different keys, but never sort of went as far harmonically as ideas that John Mayer have put in this album and since I've used that a lot more. So it's been a real influence on my songwriting. Number three, before John Mayer was touring with Steve Jordan and Pina Palladino and Isaiah Sharkey and had played with the Rolling Stones and BB King and Jay-Z and Billy Joel and all these famous names, he was just a singer songwriter playing around bars and cafes trying to make a name for himself. The consequence of writing in this way means that you have songs that stand up as acoustic arrangements that don't need a band behind them in order to function as songs. This means that the acoustic guitar on all of the tracks on this album ends up taking the role of the bass, the rhythm guitar, and also picks up melody notes in order to accompany the vocal, which not only makes the guitar really interesting to learn, but also makes it really, really fun to play because it's a completely self-contained piece of music that you don't need to have playing with other people in order to make it work. So now for the most important part of the video, how can learning these songs make you a better guitar player? Now, of course, it never hurts to learn new music in any capacity. I can't think of a single song that I've learned where I've said to myself after learning it, I'm a worse musician for having tried to learn that piece of music. Nevertheless, here are the four top things that I believe you can learn from John Mayer that will make you not just a better guitarist, but a better musician as well. Number one, writing guitar parts. One of the reasons that John Mayer has garnered such a following, not only among fans of his music, but also among the guitar community, is that he writes guitar parts. Even when he's just playing chords, he's constantly moving the harmony around within the chords to make the whole part more interesting and engaging, not only to listen to, but to learn and play as well. I feel like this is important, not only for singer-songwriters, but also for guitarists in bands. John Mayer's often talked about making statements on the guitar and not just using what the guitar naturally has available to you. And I feel like his guitar work on Room for Squares really embodies that philosophy. Learning these songs has served as a great inspiration for me to write and play more interesting guitar parts, and I feel like it can inspire you to do the same. Number two, richer harmony within and without chords. If you break down a lot of the chords that John Mayer plays in terms of how he's approaching them, they're not particularly complicated. Yes, he does use chords from parallel keys and sometimes to modulate to different keys, but we're not exactly talking giant steps here. What is interesting, however, is how he uses extensions on the chords to make the harmony sound richer, even though conceptually he's mostly thinking of the chords in terms of major and minor. It's also just giving your ear more colours to paint with. If, hypothetically, you only learned No Such Thing and St. Patrick's Day off of Room for Squares, already you've got two different versions of an E major 9 chord you can use in your own songwriting. This version here, and this version here. Now each one of those chords has got a completely different sound and is in a completely different place in the neck and so will guide your ear or your fingers or your harmonic intuition into a different place depending on what feels comfortable for your fingers. But if you didn't know those two chords in the first place, you can't then have that starting point for your intuition to then guide you into new chords and to move to different places as well. It's like adding a new colour to your creative paints. It might be a really niche colour that you hardly ever use. Magenta, ultramaroon, crimson, turquoise. But it's better to have it and use it rarely than not have it when you need it. Number three, the Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan style of playing over double stops. So building upon the fact that you've got your thumb on the bass string, it allows you to add these really interesting kind of Hendrix inspired double stops and embellishments onto the chords, which again, as I said before, are not possible if you're barring the string across all six or across all five if you're playing like an E-shaped or an A-shaped bar chord. And this doesn't necessarily just bleed into the acoustic playing and sort of the acoustic parts he writes, but even when he solos, you can sort of see what he's doing in terms of where his thumb would be if he was playing the full chord. So for example, in the solo of Love for no when he's playing you can see that he's playing a version of like an A chord with the 9 added in and then he's going from the 9 to the major third so essentially a sort of A major Hendrix style comping thing is actually being used as the lead line for the solo it carries on in the second part of the solo when he goes back to the A major chord again goes up to a B minor chord and then plays this 
which again is sort of based around like a B minor pentatonic or a Hendrix style B minor chord up to a C sharp minor. Same thing there again. And then to the, which is sort of based around a, a Hendrix style D chord. So he's sort of moving up and following the harmony and using the Hendrix style chords and embellishments with his thumb sort of pretending to play the bass note, although he's not actually always playing the bass note at the same time. So from that solo, you can sort of see the Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan influence of having the bass note being played and then having the harmony or embellishments being put over the top. And then when the bass note moves, the embellishment then changes, changes again, and then changes again. So each time he's going to a different chord, he's got a different set of embellishments that he's able to use based around that chord, which is a really Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan sort of thing to do. Once again, this is why it's so important to watch live footage of people playing, because you might assume they're playing a chord in a certain way, or a way that your fingers can play the chord when they're not, and it kind of robs you of the opportunity to get inside their mind and actually see how they're thinking about the chord as opposed to just the notes they're playing in the chord itself. Number four, percussive techniques and finger thumb separation. I feel like mechanically, this is probably the most useful thing you can learn from John Mayer's playing. If you're able to add a percussive element into the riffs that you're writing, it adds a whole other dimension of sound and interest to what the person's listening to, and it also means you're able to accompany yourself in a much more comprehensive way. Combine that with the ability to separate out what your fingers and thumbs are doing. You can potentially have three different parts moving simultaneously underneath the melody you're singing or underneath the lead line that you're playing. Once again, if I take that same four chord progression, G major, D major, E minor, C major. If I can separate out what my fingers and thumbs are doing on my picking hand, as well as adding a percussive element too, it can sound really interesting without even any embellishment just by adding these elements to the chords. It's like being in 2D and then all of a sudden being able to move in a whole different plane of motion and it'll make the guitar parts and the songs that you're writing much more interesting if you're able to do that. So that was my video on my experience of transcribing the entirety of Room for Squares for John Mayer. Thank you so much to everyone who's been so nice in the comments to the tutorials that are put up so far. If you guys are interested in more sort of John Mayer related content, please drop a like on this video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, push the notification bell so you keep up to date with all the new content coming out. Also, make sure to check out my Patreon, which you can find on this link right here. As I said before, a lot of the tutorials that I make are being demonetized because I'm using copyrighted content in them, but I feel like using that content enables the tutorials to be as in-depth and as useful as they are. It's only three pounds a month. It's the price of a small coffee or 300 penny sweets if you're feeling really uh, mathematical. And for that, you get access to all of the videos early as well as all the tabs and guitar pro tabs that I mentioned in the introduction as well. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care.